10 spot, we have Robin Kulin. Okay, this is a mysterious one to me. Robin Kulin was an astronaut in training at NASA and was in a special two year program. He outbeat 18,300 applicants and had many years of schooling and expertise to do so. So hence the reason it was such a shock for the world to learn that he just quit after a little more than a year. According to a NASA spokesperson, it was for personal reasons. Hmm, look, I've seen the movies. More than likely, knowing that NASA doesn't have a high turnover rate, Robin more than likely did not quit NASA for personal reasons. We need to get the internet detectives on this case. Did he find out a secret that disturbed him so much that he had to quit? Did he discover that they are really keeping aliens at Area 51? Who knows? My vote is for the latter. Coming up at our number nine spot, we have May Day. Not specifically NASA, but an interesting story to note from another very awesome astronaut. You may not know this, but South Korea had its very first astronaut go to space in 2008, and it was a very big deal for them. Astronaut Yi So Yin was South Korea's first and only astronaut to quit her job, but for, in my opinion, a very good reason. While on her journey home from space, she was going to find out that it it would be far from smooth. She discovered that she was veering off course, which as you can imagine was completely scary, even though spaceships tend to be slightly off course most of the time. But in any case, they did land safely, hooray, but they landed 260 miles off course near some shepherds in Kazakhstan. The people of the village thought that they were aliens. Even though she made history, she eventually ended up quitting and decided to go back to school in California. Imagine going out into space and then coming home and deciding to do something else. <laughs> Damn, that's a life lived. In our number eight spot, we have black holes. Black holes are fascinating. If you haven't heard of a black hole before, well, just know that they are some of the strangest and most fascinating objects in space. They're quote, extremely dense with such a strong gravitational attraction that not even light can escape their grasp. Apparently the Milky Way could contain over 100 million black holes. And that was where one of the first black holes was discovered in 1964. It was called Cygnus X1. NASA and Space.com have reported that, quote, astronomers saw the first signs of the black hole when a sounding rocket detected celestial sources of X-rays. In 1971, astronomers determined that the X-rays were coming from a bright blue star orbiting a strange dark object. It was suggested that the detected X-rays were a result of stellar material being stripped away from the bright star and gobbled up by the dark object, an all-consuming black hole. Yeah, that's not terrifying. I would probs quit after learning about this. In our number seven spot, we have aliens. There has been an increasing amount of aerial phenomena, as NASA puts it, otherwise known as UFOs in the last while. And so NASA has actually announced the assemblage of a team of scientists that will be examining this phenomena. Hooray! NASA said the focus will be on identifying available data, which is the best way to gather future data, and how it can use this information to advance scientific understanding of the issue. The chief of NASA's science unit, Thomas Zerbuchin, has said, quote, we're looking at the earth in new ways and we're also looking the other way, at the sky, in new ways. What we're really trying to do here is start an investigation without an outcome in mind. Well, at least they finally admit to aliens possibly existing and all the conspiracy theorists of the world can say to the people that downplayed all of the evidence, told ya. In our number six spot, we have space music. This is allegedly from the Apollo 10 mission to space. The astronauts were checking out various equipment to see what would work in space. Of course, the stakes were high because they were actually in space, and who knows if the equipment might blow up or whatnot. But apparently, when they put on headphones connected to a speaker they were testing, they heard a strange whistling sound. They were so amused and a little unsettled by this strange music that they later called it space music. In our number five spot, we have the Space Fire. Apparently, astronaut Jerry Leinger, who was stationed on the Mir Space Station, was just having his dinner when suddenly he discovered an extra tank of oxygen based chemicals catch fire. Leinger said, quote, It was a hot, hot, hot fire burning out of control. 
Apparently the fire was blocking one of the Soyuz ships that the team would have had to board in order to evacuate. So had they not put the fire out, somebody would have been left behind. Yikes, well that's a little unsettling. Thankfully, they did. In our number four spot, we have the floating animal corpses. The thought of this is literally horrific as I am obsessed with animals and refuse to kill even an ant, but hearing this isn't that surprising as apparently the first living things sent to space were a monkey and a dog. Those poor babies probably had no idea what was happening until they eventually starved to death, which, which is just <sighs> sad. Anyways, hearing this shouldn't then surprise you to hear that the corpse of the dog and monkey can be seen floating in space. Imagine seeing that and then having to go on doing what you're doing. Gah. Ah, my heart hurts. Yeah, if it wasn't already obvious that I'll never be an astronaut, well, I definitely won't be one now knowing that I may have to stumble across this. In our number three spot, we have shiny objects. This story is slightly unsettling, but also kind of makes you excited for future astronaut discoveries. Apparently, one of NASA's astronauts by the name of Alan Bean has claimed that he saw a really shiny object on the moon. When he was asked to describe it, he said that it looked like shoe leather. You usually would assume that anything from outer space is gray or black, so to hear that there's something shiny just hanging out on the moon is so interesting. It reminds me of that kid's book where that one fish was really sparkly, the rainbow fish. <laughs> Loved that book. They were never able to learn anything more, but could this be the moon's version of a diamond? Probably. In our number two spot, we have they're watching us. Allegedly, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in 1969, it is said that NASA lost transmission for about two minutes. Apparently, during those two minutes, there was a secret message to NASA that said, those babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh God, you won't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecrafts out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Whoa. Okay, well, I am now a believer in the fact that I'm sure they did not lose transmission. And I'm sure NASA only said that so that the general employees and people watching could not hear what needed to be said. Finally, in our number one spot, we have a fleet of UFOs. Apparently, astronaut Gordon Cooper witnessed the most crazy thing in human history, in my opinion. Proof that our future could potentially be Star Wars in real life. He saw a fleet of UFOs. That's right. He claims to have seen it around the time he flew the Air Force. What's wild is that about 10 years later, he'd bear witness to another UFO. Also the luckiest man in history. Allegedly in 1963, a UFO flew towards him. Apparently it was picked up on a radar too, which confirms the proof of existence and Gordon's story. Whoa. Fun fact. I once saw a floating light in the sky and then I saw it literally zoom away at lighting speed, not lying, so I'm pretty sure I also have seen a UFO. <laughs> All right, coming in at number 10, we have space snakes. Dr. Musgrave is a trustworthy man, or at least his credentials suggest he must be. Not only is he a NASA astronaut, he has six degrees, and he's a doctor and a mathematician. He has made six space flights, and he believes that there is life out there. In 1994, he said, on two of my missions, and I still don't have an answer, I have seen a snake out there. What? It's not just a wee little space snake either, he said that it was 6, 7 or 8 feet long. He said that the snake followed him around for a long period of time and he tried to communicate with it. Space snakes, honestly. Dr. Musgrave thinks that they must have their own propulsion technique, which honestly is just baffling and is a can of worms or snakes. Coming in at number 9, we have asteroids. Astronaut Chris Hadfield conducted a Reddit AMA and he discussed something that scared him. He said, Sometimes we hear pings as tiny rocks hit our spaceship, and also the creaks and snaps of expanding metal as we go in and out of sunlight. The solar panels are filled with tiny holes from micrometeorites. Honestly, that really terrifies me as a person who's like a bit scared of flying in an aeroplane. This would deeply stress me out. He also said, I watched a large meteorite burn up between me and Australia, and to think of that hypersonic dumb lump of rock randomly hurtling into us instead sent a shiver up my back. Like, I'll say Chris mate, Jesus. 
Coming in to number 8 we have The Formation. Gordon Cooper, the last American to spend time in space alone, has had a couple of very strange experiences in the skies. The first happened when he was a member of the Air Force. He was flying with other pilots in 1951 when he saw I quote, a vast armada of UFOs flying in formation at extremely high altitudes. I'm sorry, but vast armada, that is terrifying, not just one curious UFO, a whole fleet. On top of that, in 1963, Cooper was shot into space aboard a Mercury capsule to circumnavigate the world. As he was passing Perth, he noticed a fast flying green object that was also picked up by Australian tracking systems. Now the press were briefed that they were not allowed to talk to him about this. Why? Like seriously why? Coming into number 7 we have the check mark. American astronaut Leroy Chiao was the commander of the International Space Station in 2005. During his time up there he saw some extremely weird things. He explained his encounter to the Huffington Post by saying, I saw some lights that seemed to be in a line and it was almost like an upside down check mark and I saw them fly by and I thought it was awfully strange. Could this have been the formation that Cooper was talking about? Some skeptics even tried to pass the lights off as far off fishing boat lights from Earth, but to be honest, I'm skeptical of those skeptics. Coming in at number 6, we have Magnificent Desolation. What is it like on the moon? Um, utterly terrifying according to Buzz Aldrin. Buzz, as we know, was the second man on the moon. Yes, televised recordings of the moon can be seen, and yes, we have high res photographs, but truly knowing what it feels like to be up there is something only a handful of people can talk to us about. In a Reddit AMA, Buzz Aldrin describes his experience. He said, my first words of my impression of being on the surface of the moon that just came to my mind are magnificent desolation. He continued by saying, There is no place on Earth as desolate as what I was viewing in those first few moments on the lunar surface. Beyond me, I could see the moon curving away, no atmosphere, black sky, cold, colder than anyone could experience on Earth when the sun is up. While that sounds totally incredible, it also sounds like the beginnings of a total existential breakdown. Coming into number 5, we have the spheres. In 1981, following the Saljut mission, the USSR cosmonaut Major General Vladimir Kolvianok gave a press conference in which he shared some very interesting information. He said that he looked out of a porthole and saw something he simply couldn't explain, something impossible to the laws of physics. He described the object he saw as spherical and elliptical, saying that it exploded into a beautiful golden light. After that, he saw two more spheres and a white smoke sphere cloud. Then, as they flew through the Terminator, the name for the zone between light and day, he lost sight of them. Honestly, how fascinating and terrifying at the very same time. To me, it's also weird and interesting how Russia appears to be more forthcoming in discussing things that they've seen in space, whereas the United States are keen to keep a lid on it. Why do you think the United States are so heavily guarded on what they'll say about what they've seen in space? Honestly, I don't know. Coming into number four, we have the knocking. In 2003, Yang Liwei was the first first Chinese astronaut to be propelled into space. Now I understand the loneliness of space might send you a little bit mad, but he said one night that he heard a strange and continuous knocking. He said, and I quote, Someone was knocking on the body of the spaceship, just as knocking an iron bucket with a wooden hammer. It neither came from outside nor inside the spaceship. I'm sorry, but honestly, what? Isn't that some of the creepiest space descriptions that you've ever heard? It seems he wasn't the last to hear it either. Two further astronauts heard the same space knocks when they went up there. What are these? Coming into number three, we have the music. Listening to the transcript of the words said on board Apollo 10 is bone chilling. The spaceship passed by the dark side of the moon, and as it did, the astronauts heard a very weird ethereal music. This is what was said between Eugene Cernan, Thomas Stafford, and John Young. That music sounds out of spacey, doesn't it? Do you hear that whistling sound? Yes. Boy, that sure is weird music. We're gonna have to find out about that. Nobody will believe us. Later, Cernan said, That eerie music is what's bothering me. You know what? I hear it too. Who is going to believe it? Nobody. Shall we tell them about it? I don't know, I think we ought to think about it some. It seems that the Apollo 11 crew heard it too. What was it? 
I don't really know. Coming into number two, we have heat is rising in the capsule. So this is really sad and really disturbing, so do skip forward if you aren't ready for something truly terrifying. In 1967, Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Komarov did not make it back to Earth alive, something he suspected would happen when he agreed to be the solo pilot of the Soyuz 1. His spacecraft malfunctioned and he was quite aware he was going to die. Some of the last things he said can't be translated into to words, he was screaming and crying words of anger. Among the last words that can be deciphered are, the heat is rising in the capsule and you've killed me. Ooh, honestly that makes me so sad. Finally coming into number one, we have they're watching us. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon, had something very scary to say when he arrived at the moon in the Apollo 11 mission. It was something he spoke about once, but never spoke about again. In a secret transmission to NASA, according to the retired chief of communication system, Morris Chatelain, the first man on the moon's first words were actually, oh god, you won't believe it, I'm telling you there are other spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge, they're on the moon watching us. Now this wasn't heard by the world as the broadcast was dropped for two minutes. Armstrong never spoke about it again, although a lot of credible sources have confirmed that this is what he said. Number 10, a car crash. Let's start with the drama here. Pretty sure if you say you're an astronaut, people are going to look at you differently in a good way. Man, you've been to space. After all, you are a human being who has seen just how small the world is compared to the wide, wide universe. Many revere James Donald Halsell Jr. after the five space shuttle missions he took before retiring in 2006. But he must have hit the ground hard when he came down to Earth. Halsell was traveling in his car to West Monroe, Louisiana and stopped at a Motel 6. While there, he downed three glasses of wine before heading back on the road, which is a no-no. Therefore, tragedy struck. James crashed into a car killing two of the young passengers in the vehicle who flew from the car when they crashed. He was going extremely fast and reportedly tried to steal a bystander's car when he stopped at the site. James told police that he didn't remember leaving the hotel or how the crash occurred. Though they found no drugs at the scene, police did find 10 empty sleeping pill packages back at the room. NASA declined to comment about the arrest. Very, very sad. Number 9. A love triangle. This one? Oh my god. This next one is pretty rough. We all know what it's like to go through a breakup. It's not fun. It sucks. It doesn't necessarily bring out the best in you. Mother of three and mission flight engineer as well as crew member on the 13 day shuttle mission, Lisa Nowak was a prominent figure in NASA's astronaut team. She was even the inspiration for Natalie Portman in the film Lucy in the Sky before she went all breakup song on her ex. In February 2007, Lisa drove from Houston to Orlando, Florida wearing diapers so she didn't have to stop, to confront the woman who she claimed stole her man. She claimed she was going to have a calm conversation, but instead she ended up attacking her. She was in a wig and a trench coat and there was pepper spray, it was a whole ordeal. William O'Fallon and Nowak trained together and began an affair in 2004. Both divorced their partners with Nowak thinking her future was with William. Wrong. William started exclusively dating Air Force Captain Colleen Shipman and he thought Noak took it well when he told her. Instead, she ended up sneaking into his apartment, read their email exchanges and well, flash forward to a 900 mile drive, pepper spray and nightmares Shipman will have for the rest of her life. Initially arrested on the attempted murder charges, they were dropped to less aggressive accusations like attempted burglary and kidnapping. Shipman and Bill are now married while Noak, after years of counseling, is doing much better, though she refuses to talk about the event for obvious reasons. I hope you're doing better. Number 8. Married to his work. NASA ended up wanting so little to do with this guy that they actually fired him. Today, divorce is about as common as breakups in high school. Though some happy news, it looks like the percentage is going down, but in the 60s, getting divorced was a major taboo. NASA's astronauts were about the closest thing to comic book heroes the world had ever seen, and they knew that public opinion was a huge part of their funding. So, when an astronaut hero misbehaved, NASA wasn't going to stand for it. Don Esol wasn't exactly a faithful husband and he rarely visited his son who was dying of leukemia. He also cheated on his wife multiple times at Cape Canaveral which was flooded with eager groupies. He gaslighted his wife several times when she asked him to admit it and when she suggested going to therapy if he thought she was crazy, he replied, but I'll lose my job. Don and Harriet at last divorced and NASA soon followed firing Don as well. Bye Don. <laughs> 
the Elena. Number seven, the astronauts' wives' club. Hoo hoo hoo! Not a fun time. Speaking of astronauts behaving badly, let's talk about the reports of the astronauts' wives' club. These lovely ladies were used to a measly military pay when suddenly they became celebrities overnight. And given the aforementioned squeaky clean image NASA wanted to protect, any scandal was swept under the rug, according to the Astronauts Wives Club, a true story by Lily Copel. On the outside, they were the ideal Stepford Wives, apple pie baking, apron wearing beauties. But out of the 30 astronaut marriages from 1961 to 69, only 7 would stay married. The biggest wedge in the marriage was the time the men spent at Florida's Cape Canaveral, which I previously mentioned, which became off limits playground. Cape Cookies became the name of the women who would magically appear to have their own rockets launched by the men who would touch the stars. To handle the silence and stress, the wives turned to excessive ways to self medicate the nightly gin and tonic with a tranquilizer garnish. Yeah. Pretty rough. Number six, fireflies. Ice particles, they said. Part of the capsule heat shield, they said. Could it have been that John Glenn saw something else instead? Glenn was the first American astronaut to orbit the planet in 1962. He was also one of the good ones. He and his wife Annie were married for 73 years. In fact, when he left to fight in World War II, he told her, and I quote, I'm just going down to the corner store to get a pack of gum. To which she replied, Don't be long. He said that every time he went away to war. She kept a gum wrapper in her purse every time after that. Anyways, grab a tissue, that's super cute, let's continue. Glenn, while flying over Australia, saw strange floating mass like tiny little stars outside the Friendship 7 capsule. When he tapped on the window, they flew off. Mission Control were at first concerned the anomalies were fragments of the heat shield, but that wasn't the case. No, no, it was something else. NASA has since explained the sighting as ice particles, but up until his death in 2016, Glenn never really believed it. His wife Annie finally joined him at Peace passing away due to COVID complications at the age of 100 in May 2020. Number 5. Space Music According to the Guinness Book of World Records, the first song played in space was Jingle Bells on the 16th of December 1965. It was broadcasted during NASA's Gemini GA space flight. Though there have been several musicians played out there in the big space ever since, there remains an artist unknown. Eugene Cernan in the Apollo 10 space capsule reported hearing a strange kind of music during a mission. What he described was a strange musical whistling sound like how you would imagine space music to be like the I can't do it. Just imagine very sci-fi. He reached out to NASA Mission Control to see if they'd heard it too. According to the mission transcripts released in 2008, the sounds were recorded. Of course, alien theories have spread far and wide, but NASA made no comment. Then in the Apollo 11, Michael Collins recorded hearing the same sound while orbiting the moon. This time NASA was prepared. They said it was, and I quote, interference between the LMs and command modules VHS radios, unquote. Sure it was NASA. Sure it was. Number 4. Bright Lights and Beyond It might surprise you to learn that not only do we have a ton of garbage down here on Earth, but a ton of space junk sits just above us. In fact, the estimate for just how much is staggering. Around 128 million pieces, about 6,000 tons of space debris in space. Earth's low orbit carries millions of rocket and spacecraft fragments along with dead satellites. Each one is flying around 18,000 miles per hour, so faster than a bullet, yeah. So the likelihood of astronauts encountering space debris is pretty high, but this one example is pretty staggering. But that doesn't stop this case from being very strange. Brent Jett was in the STS-115 mission in 2006 on his way to help construct the ISS. But then he noticed, and I quote, some kind of reflective structure, unquote, outside the shuttle. According to him, quote, it doesn't look like anything I've ever seen outside of this shuttle, that's for sure, unquote. NASA took control of the camera and there were three bright objects in the sky. When they ordered an inspection of the craft, they saw nothing. Not even a hint. Space junk? Or aliens? NASA has no explanation and they won't talk about it, so what is it? And heading on to our top three, number three, the Gordo UFO. I suppose it's not too hard to guess that Major Gordo Cooper was a lover of all things space, but it turns out that his adoration goes deeper than that. In 1957, 30 year old Cooper was test pilot and project manager of the fighter section of the Experimental Flight Test Engineering Division at Edwards AFB in California. Two members of his crew one morning mentioned to him that they caught sight 
shape of a strange saucer like object. It apparently didn't make a sound as it landed and took off. The two men took photos of the craft and Cooper was ordered to have the film developed, have no prints made, and send it right away to the Pentagon. He was also instructed not to look, but like of course he did. He saw exactly what the two men described and to his very deathbed insisted the government was covering it up. But not only that, on his 1963 solo trip, he had a close encounter that was broadcasted on NBC. He saw a glowing green object approaching and it was picked up on radar. But when he got to Earth, he wasn't allowed to talk about it. Number two, edits in space. Could NASA be editing the footage sent down from the International Space Station? This theory is hot among conspirators. The idea really started to gain traction in July 2016. Two different cameras, 25 hours apart, spotted a distinct square shape, larger than the Earth. Initially, UFO hunters concluded that it had to be some kind of unidentified object in our orbit, but another theory surfaced that the shapes were actually attempts by NASA to edit something else. Else out. Could it be meteors or a cover up of something NASA has determined we are not ready to see yet? NASA was forced to deny that they didn't attempt a cover up, but UFO hunters will never rest until the truth is revealed, even if it has been already, so we don't really know what's true. And last but not least, the Reich and NASA. Well, this is a surprising little tidbit, but honestly, I'm not too surprised. This is definitely worthy of being number one, especially since NASA doesn't advertise it really at all. During World War II, the US recruited the help of over 1600 German Yahtzee scientists. Yes, I said Yahtzee because apparently YouTube gets scared they are death eaters. Anyways, they hired over 1600 German Yahtzee scientists in institutes like NASA to increase their payroll. The code name for this operation was Operation Paperclip because of all the paperclips on the immigration files, which brought in Werner von Braun and his V2 rocket team. The former SS officer would become a US citizen and was a key architect in the Apollo program. What? In 1977, he was awarded the National Medal of Science despite having previously handpicked slave laborers in Buchenwald for his rocket building efforts. Yeah, so. That's special. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the fireflies. In February 1962, John Glenn noticed something strange outside the window while aboard the Friendship 7 spacecraft. He noticed strange glowing particles floating in space nearby that looked like fireflies. He radioed down to mission control saying, this is Friendship 7. I'll try to describe what I'm in here. I'm in a big mass of some very small particles that are brilliantly lit up like they're luminescent. I never saw anything like it. They're round a little, they're coming by the capsule and they look like little stars, a whole shower of them coming by. They swirl around the capsule and go in front of the window and they're all brilliantly lighted. They probably average maybe 7 or 8 feet apart, but I can see them all down below me also. John then went on to say that they were moving very slowly and almost seemed to be matching his current speed. After a thorough investigation, NASA scientists deduced that the lights were probably frost flakes that were being lit up as they fell away from the craft. They admitted that that does kind of make them look like fireflies. Of course, there are still people out there online that insist this may have been a first contact with some sort of glowing space books. Next up at number 9 now we have The Glass Dome. Richard Hoagland is an author who wrote a conspiracy theory book about the Apollo missions called Dark Mission. Now, In it, he claims that ancient builders constructed enormous domes enclosing huge areas of the moon's surface. They would have had water and air inside them at one point. He claims there are actually hidden lunar cities that appear blurred and distorted because they're being viewed through this glass. Of course, the next question question is, where is he getting all this from? Well, he points out that Apollo 12 astronaut Alan Bean said that on that mission, space seen from the lunar surface was black but shiny as if it was being viewed through glass. Of course, Hoagland used this as proof of his glass dome theory, saying space should be velvet black, it should be inky black, it should be infinity, unending, deep, endless black, it shouldn't be shiny. This is something that Alan Bean has denied and does not claim himself but the story has gained traction among some conspiracy theory groups. Moving on to number 8 now, we have Musa Manarov. That's the name of this former cosmonaut who is known for spending 541 consecutive days in space. It's safe to say he was an experienced cosmonaut who received numerous awards and honours. In all those years, he never reported 
anything too out of the ordinary except for one time in 1991. That year Manorov was on a mission to the Mir space station and was filming a visiting space capsule dock nearby. He filmed its approach. As he filmed its approach he saw an object that looked like it was coming off the spacecraft. Here's some of that footage so you can see for yourself. And this by Ma uh, Musa Manorov is a uh, the best known one from Russia, I believe. Okay, I think we can immediately, uh, being out in space here, dismiss the possibility that this is, yeah, a, it is, space is a rock. Now, whatever that was, it freaked him out and he became convinced he had seen something unusual. He said he knew there was nothing that could come loose at that point during the docking procedure. As he continued to watch the object, it floated downwards and away from the capsule. When this footage began to be shared around the world, some people claimed it was nothing more than space junk, but Manorov said he knows what he saw up there and it was definitely not space junk. Next up after the 7 now guys we have the dots. In March 2017 UFO hunters claim they had found proof of aliens in NASA's own footage. The video in question shows astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti demonstrating how to operate window shutters on the ISS. Now as she talks to the camera in the video we see several white objects coming into view. The UFO community quickly jumped on this and referred to it as the smoking gun. There was no denying a big alien cover up now. Of course, there's always two sides to the story though. Scott Brando is a man who forensically examines alleged UFO pictures and videos. He gave this video the same treatment and concluded that the lights were either lens reflections or ice particles. Not quite as exciting, but maybe that's the truth. Moving on to number 6 now, we have the organic being. In August 2018, former NASA astronaut Leland Melvin tweeted out that he saw something curved and organic looking floating outside of his craft while aboard the space shuttle Atlantis. Naturally, the first thing he did was tell NASA about it, but they said what he was seeing was not extraterrestrial, but just a piece of ice. Now, when he shared this story on Twitter, the Twitter account for UFO sightings daily asked him if he thought that NASA was lying about that. They believe that his opinion of something looking organic is much more reliable than the opinion of someone on the ground over 400 miles away. Melvin replied that he didn't think so, but you never know. Now, some people even thought that Melvin might have made the whole thing up just to, I don't know, entertain people. All of this has left many questions about his story ice or organic being? Only Melvin really knows. Moving on to number 5 now, we have The Wolves. This is an incredible story, honestly. It's a terrifying account from Russian cosmonaut Alexei Leonov. Now, in 1965, he famously performed the first spacewalk ever. It was a success, but it was very nearly a disaster. During the war, he experienced both air leaks in his suit and material unexpectedly stiffening. This meant he was almost unable to cram himself back inside the capsule. He actually had to lower his own suit pressure and risk getting the bends when he was inside. If that wasn't bad enough, his craft went off course during re-entry and landed in the Ural Mountains where he and his commander were forced to wait for rescue as howling wolves began to encircle them. How crazy is that? Next time you guys think you've had a bad day, just spare a thought for Alexei Leonov. Alright, at the number 4 spot now guys, we have the cryptic message. In 2016, NASA astronaut Scott Kelly gave an interview that conspiracy theorists say contained cryptic messages about seeing aliens in space. In the video, he talked about his 340 days on the International Space Station, and then people say he slipped up and mentioned a cover up by NASA and the US government. Kelly was asked about his body's response to being in space for so long. He said, and I quote, adjusting to space is easier than a adjusting to earth for me. I don't think I ever felt completely normal up there. I think coming back to gravity is harder than leaving gravity, so maybe the aliens got it a lot easier than we do. It was that mentioning of the word alien that sent alarm bells ringing among the conspiracy theorists. He also spoke about a virtual reality game that the astronauts play on the space station, which simulated an alien attack on the space station. Once again, conspiracy theorists were asking why would NASA make such a violent game, especially one with such a terrifying scenario. Once again, this is one of those stories where it's NASA's word against people who just don't seem to trust NASA. What do you guys think though? Moving on to number 3 now, we have the flashing lights. This is a very famous set of stories if you're familiar with the moon landings. During the Apollo missions that took astronauts to the moon for the first time, several astronauts reported seeing strange flashing lights. They claimed that these lights flashed in their eyeballs 
even when their eyes were closed. On one mission, astronaut Charles Duke wore a helmet, closed his eyes, and he still described the light flashes he was seeing to his team. He said they were clusters of white streaks. They happened at the exact same moment that his helmet recorded cosmic rays passing through his helmet and his head. Coincidence? Well, Apparently not. NASA confirmed that the astronauts were actually seeing cosmic rays, something we don't see here on Earth because they're all absorbed by our atmosphere. They're so powerful that you can even see them in space with your eyes closed. That's pretty mental. Moving on to the number two spot now, we have the floater. On the morning of August 19th, 2013, NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy noticed something floating outside of the International Space Station. Here's a little clip so you can see for yourself. Uh, Chris Cassidy had noted an object that was uh, floating past the station near the uh, station Progress 52 cargo ship. Cassidy noticed this near the Progress cargo vehicle. He called down to Mission Control Houston and took some video of it. Now, at first, NASA was just as confused as he was. Was this a UFO? It certainly fit the literal description of an unidentified flying object. After a lot of speculation, NASA said it was an antenna cover from Russia's Zvezda service module. However, many people remain totally unconvinced. They believe that the object is something extraterrestrial, not something of human origin, and that NASA has made up this cover story to avoid public alarm. Personally, as you might know by now, I believe NASA, but what do you guys think? And finally, number one now, we have the saucer. This story comes from Donald Slayton, an astronaut during the Mercury missions. He revealed in an interview that he saw UFOs in 1951. He said, I was testing a P-51 fighter in Minneapolis when I spotted this object. I was at about 10,000 feet on a nice, bright, sunny afternoon. I thought the object was a kite, then I realized that no kite is gonna fly that high. As I got closer, it looked like a weather balloon, gray, and about three feet in diameter, but as soon as I got behind the darn thing, it didn't look like a balloon anymore. It looked like a saucer, a disc. About the same time, I realized that it was suddenly going away from me, and there I was, running at about 300 miles per hour. I tracked it for a little way, and then all of a sudden, the damn thing just took off. It pulled about a 45 degree climbing turn and accelerated and just flat disappeared. An interesting story, and it's of particular interest to UFO enthusiasts because neither Slayton or NASA has provided a rational explanation for this very speedy saucer. Coming in at number 10 is Vladimir Komarov. Vladimir Komarov was the first astronaut who died directly in space. This was the first mission of the Soviet Soyuz 1 spacecraft on the 23rd of April 1967. Komarov was supposed to test the ship name in manned mode and conduct the world's first docking in space with another Soyuz 2 spacecraft. However, the plan never succeeded and Komarov became the first astronaut lost in space. After the launch of the Soyuz 1 spacecraft into orbit, one of the two solar panels did not open and the spacecraft began to lack electricity for the correct system operations. Komarov tried to open the panel by spinning the ship around its axis, but but this did not help. Due to the malfunction, the launch of Soyuz 2 was cancelled and the flight of Soyuz 1 was terminated ahead of schedule. The spacecraft successfully deorbited, but after re-entry for unknown reasons, the parachute system failed. As a result, the descent vehicle hit the ground at a fast speed, which resulted in the astronauts' instant death. As a result, the parachute system was modified and the shortcomings were eliminated. Number 9. Hylian Myth Even though Komarov's death is considered to be the starting point of space travel deaths, there is a myth that he was not the first astronaut lost in space. An American science fiction writer, Robert Heinlein, claimed that a similar incident took place even before Gargarian's flight into space. On May 15, 1990, the USSR launched the Vostok 1 1KP prototype into orbit. The goal was to test the altitude control systems and the declaration engine to make sure that the ship was able to go into a descent path on the MCC command. However, the flight ended in failure. One KP rose to a higher orbit and got stuck there for many years. Allegedly, the ship did not have life support systems, but many believed it was manned. The Western press wrote that the pilot, Gennady Zavodesky, was on board. Such a person really existed, but at that time, he was not part of the Soviet astronaut team. And Halian claimed that Soviet citizens told him about the astronaut during his visit to USSR. However, I cannot, in all fairness, prove the myth by adding this alleged death to the question of has anyone been lost in space? Number 8. Clifton Williams. Clifton Williams
Williams was an American naval aviator, test pilot, mechanical engineer, major in the US Marine Corps, and a NASA astronaut who was killed in a plane crash. To be clear, he never went into space, but this was part of the space program. The crash was caused by a mechanical failure to a NASA T-38 jet trainer, which he was piloting to visit his parents in Mobile, Alabama. The failure caused the flight controls to stop responding, and although he activated the ejection seat, it did not save him. The aircraft crashed in Florida near Tallahassee within an hour of departing Patrick AFB. Number 7. X-15 Flight 191 During X-15 Flight 191 on November 15, 1967, Michael J. Adams had his seventh flight and the plane had an electrical problem followed by control problems at the apogee of its flight. Adams was an American aviator, aeronautical engineer, and USAF astronaut. He was one of the 12 pilots who flew the North American X-15, an experimental space plane jointly operated by the Air Force and NASA. On November 15, 1967, Adams flew X-15 Flight 191, also known as X-15 Flight 36597, aboard the X-15-3, one of the three planes that X-15 had in its fleet. Flying to an attitude above 50 miles, Adams qualified as an astronaut, according to the United States definition of the boundary of space. Moments later, the aircraft broke apart, killing Adams and destroying the X-15-3. He was the first American space mission fatality by the American Convention. Number Number 6. Apollo 1 Apollo 1, initially designed as AS-204, was intended to be the first crewed mission of the Apollo program, the American undertaking to land the first man on the moon. It was planned to launch on February 21st, 1967 as the first low Earth orbital test of the Apollo Command and Service Module. During a plugs out test of the Apollo hardware, which its first version could be terribly described as a flying turd, a combination of factors including over pressure, pure oxygen environment, an egress hatch that opened inward, and excessive velcro and other flammable material, plus a spark from somewhere under the astronauts' couches caused a cabin fire. This happened during a launch rehearsal test at Cape Kennedy Air Force Station Launch Complex 34 on January 27th, and it killed all three crew members. Three astronauts were killed, likely by inhalation of toxic fumes from the velcro burning quickly. Number 5. Soyuz 11. Vlad Flokov, Gregory Dubrovlovsky and Viktor Palsov all died in space during the Soyuz 11 mission on June 30th, 1971. The astronaut crew successfully docked with the Salyut 1 orbital station and began its reactivation. On the 11th day of the mission, a fire broke out in the station, so it had to be abandoned. On June 29th, Soyuz 11 successfully undocked and began deorbiting. However, shortly after the separation from the ship, communication with the astronaut crew was interrupted. The descent vehicle landed successfully in the assigned area, but the rescue team found the astronauts dead. It was found that the astronaut death occurred as a result of depressurization and abrupt onset of decompression sickness. The astronauts tried to eliminate the air leak, however, in the extreme conditions of the fog that filled the cabin after depressurization, severe pain throughout the body, and loss of hearing due to burst eardrums, the astronauts did not immediately establish the cause of the leak and simply did not have enough time to save themselves. Number 4. Valentin Bonarenko Valentin Bonarenko was a Soviet fighter pilot selected in 1960 for training as a cosmonaut. During a 15-day endurance experiment in a low-pressure altitude chamber with at least 50% oxygen atmosphere, Bonarenko, having completed work for the day, removed monitoring biosensors from his body and washed his skin with an alcohol-soaked cotton ball, which he then discarded. The cotton ball landed on an electric hot plate, which he was using to brew a cup of tea. The cotton ignited and Bonarco tried to smother the flames with the sleeve of his woolen coveralls, which caught fire in the chamber's oxygen-rich atmosphere. Because of the pressure difference, it took a watching doctor nearly half an hour to open the chamber door. Bonarco's clothing was burned until almost all the oxygen in the chamber was used up, and he had suffered third-degree burns over most of his body. The attending physician at Bokhtkin Hospital, surgeon and traumatologist Vladimir Golahos, 
Kowalski recalled in 1984 that while attempting to start an invanious drip, the only blood vessels he could find for inserting a needle were on the soles of his feet, which where his flight boots had warded off the flames. The Soviet government concealed the death along with Bafarangso's membership of the cosmonaut corpse until 1880 and a crater on the moon's far side is now named after him. Number 3. Columbia Space Shuttle Crash On the 1st of February 2003, the second space shuttle crash occurred. Shuttle Columbia was returning to Earth after 16 days of flight. Approximately 16 minutes before the expected landing, communication with the crew was interrupted. Eyewitnesses filmed the burning wreckage of the shuttle flying at an altitude of about 63 kilometers. All seven astronauts were lost in space. They were Rick Husband, William C. McCool, Elon Rahman, Michael P. Anderson, Camp La Chawa, David M. Brown, and Laurel Clark. As the investigation showed, the cause of the disaster was a breakdown that arose back at the start. About 82 seconds into the flight, a piece of insulation detached from the left fairing, which struck the carbon fiber panel of the Columbia's left wing and probably left a hole in the thermal installation layer. Because of this, after entering the dense layers of the atmosphere, the leading edge of the left wing began to heat up more than usual and the wing began to collapse and after it, the shuttle itself collapsed. Notably, incidents with detached pieces of thermal insulation from the shuttles were observed before, but test shows that they do not pose a threat to the astronauts. Losing Columbia became a turning point in the space shuttle program, and the shuttle astronaut flights were interrupted for several years, and in 2011, the program was finally closed due to the high risk of astronauts' lives. Number 2. Spaceship 2 On October 31st, 2014, another astronaut was lost in space. It was Michael Ellsbury, the pilot of the suborbital spacecraft Spaceship 2 of Virgin Galactic. During the 55th test flight of the ship, serious anomalies were discovered, which led to the spacecraft crash. The cause was called crew error. The pilots unblocked the tail section of the vehicle ahead of time without gaining the necessary speed and also did not perform the necessary actions to transfer the tail section to a vertical position. As a result, the ship began to rotate around its axis and then fell apart. The wreckage was scattered all over a radius of 8 kilometers. First pilot Michael Ellsbury was killed, but co-pilot Peter Sebold managed to eject. The pilot astronaut survived but was seriously injured. Fortunately, the failure did not become fatal for the Richard Branson company. Virgin Galactic worked out its bugs and in July 2021 carried out the first ever suborbital tourist space flight, ushering the area of space tourism. And coming in at number one is the Space Shuttle Challenger. In the 1980s, the era of space shuttles began, which finally established US supremacy in space. These were reusable rocket planes that made a real revolution in space tech but still were not without significant shortcomings, which eventually became the cause of the biggest space travel disasters. Due to scheduling issues with what had been called Go Fever, STS-51L launched in suboptimal temperatures on January 28, 1986. The cold weather weakened the O-rings that sealed each section of the tall, white, solid rocket booster segments and prevented the exhaust gases from shooting out of any direction but down. The seals failed over approximately 26 degrees of the arc on the starboard side of the S. RB in the lowest of four segment joints. Exhaust flames escaped through the breach, pushing the SRB into the large rust colored external tank. The starboard off strut then connected the SRB to the ET, was pushed into the hydrogen tank, which shot up through the inter tank into the oxygen tank. This destroyed the ET structure entirely. The orbiter survived this event, but because of its orientation to the free flow, aerodynamic forces quickly disintegrated the orbiter. The crew compartment survived the breakup, and when recovered, it was discovered that several switches had been moved from their launch normal positions, indicating that the crew was conscious for some time after the breakup and tried to recover. The crew compartment impacted the ocean surface at a terminal velocity which was far too fast to survive, and all seven members of the crew passed away. These members were F. Richard Scorby, Michael J. Smith, Ronald McNair, Elson Orzinka, Judith Resnick, Gregory Jarvis, and Krista McClough. To this day, it is still unknown whether the astronauts were conscious at the time of impact, although it's judged unlikely. Starting us off at number 10 is the Dark Flow. Now this wasn't in the past because it's technically very much still happening and it is borderline terrifying. Now I don't want to alarm anyone but something, something bigger than anything we know of is sucking portions of the Milky Way galaxy just away. Sucking it away. Milky Way? Us? We are getting sucked away. We're just gone. Just wanted to emphasize that. Now in 2009 researchers discovered a cluster of galaxies that were moving at unparalleled speeds towards a patch of sky between the constellations. Vela and Centaurus. There's just no reason for galaxies to be moving at that speed unless they're experiencing a huge pull 
from something beyond us. This process was dubbed dark flow and scientists speculate that there are mega structures beyond our horizon that could be what's pulling them. Now others even say the mega structures are parallel universes. And surely you guys know what my next question from here is. Now if the Milky Way is getting sucked into the ether, how long till that reaches Earth? How much time does my ass have to planet hop? We need to do that ASAP Rocky. Bye! And coming in at number 9 is the alien music which unfortunately cannot be found on Spotify or Apple Music so you guys just don't even bother trying to find it. You know, just don't, don't bother. Now back in 1969, 4 days after we stepped foot on the moon for the first time, astronauts John Young, Tom Strafford and Gene Cernan were on the far dark side of the moon and as Mufasa said to Simba, we don't go there. Now the 3 men were just chilling on the moon, taking some pictures of the craters and drinking some grape juice when they started hearing a strange otherworldly sort of noise inside their headsets. Now the music continued for a good hour and none of the men had heard these types of sounds before and they knew no one would believe them if they said anything. They tried to find out where or what the music was but they just simply couldn't. Decades later the mystery was never solved but some claim it was just sound coming from radio interference between spacecrafts. Which I get but how would 3 seasoned astronauts not know what that sounded like? Like they probably would have heard that a billion times so I mean I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Sus. At number 8 we have space snakes. Now if you thought you were smart let me just put you in your place real quick. You may as well just sit down right now. So this one comes from Dr. Story Musgrave, a man who has 6 academic degrees, was part of the marine corps, is a physician and mathematician and he's a bloody NASA astronaut as well and oh he shares the record of most space flights ever taken. So I mean this man has literally lived 9 lives in one and like saved some for the rest of us. Like I'm just trying to get by at this point. Either way Story said on 2 of his missions he saw something out there that he doesn't have an answer to. He saw a snake sort of thing and it was about 6 to 8 feet long, it was rubbery and it had internal waves inside of it. And it sort of just follows you for an extended period of time. He claims that being in space makes you see things you'd never imagine, well no sh**. I didn't have to have 6 degrees to say that, and that he believes there are creatures out there much more developed than any of us. I mean they've been there for 100 million years, I'd hope they're advanced as hell, I'd be disappointed if they weren't. Now honestly my theory on the snake is that they're alien devices that just roam space and can detect spacecrafts in the area and sort of tail them and send information back to the alien HQ that deployed it. And I feel like that's a bang on theory. Like go me. <laughs> yeah. Filling our number 7 slot is the near miss. So back in July of 2012, life as we know it was this close to being changed forever. This is how small my patience is when it comes to Che as well, just letting you know. Now the earth narrowly, like barely by the skin of our teeth missed the impact of an extreme solar storm and not just any storm, the most powerful one we'd seen in 150 years. If it had hit earth we would have still been picking up the pieces right now. If you don't know what a solar storm is, another name for it is a geomagnetic storm storm and it's basically when the earth's magnetosphere experiences a temporary disturbance due to either a solar wind shock wave and or a cloud of magnetic fields. Now solar storms threaten every form of high technology that we have. It starts off with an explosion that expends tons of x-rays and extreme UV radiation to earth at light speed cause screw us right? If we had been hit by the storm there would have been radio blackouts, satellites would have been blasted with energy and been damaged, GPS navigation just wouldn't work and the world would have no power whatsoever. I mean we missed it that time but who knows if we'll be as lucky the next time. I frankly will be on Mars at that point so I don't really give a <laughs> Even savage moments. Now at number 6 is the Cooper sighting. So Gordon Cooper is an astronaut that's flown the Gemini 5 and the Mercury 9. He was also the last American to ever spend time in space alone. Now in May of 1963 he was doing a circumnavigational trip around the earth on the Mercury capsule and when he was passing Perth he saw something. A massive green glowing object came straight for him at a speed he'd never seen before. It was real, it wasn't just a delusion and the much he tracked station in Western Australia even picked it up on their radar so it was very much there. Cooper reported it to NBC but when he landed was told they couldn't question him about it. So that's just another thing they won't tell us. I feel like we should honestly just start rioting until governments all over the world stop keeping from us. I'm over it. Just tell us things. 
Hello. Expose the government 2K19. Coming in at number five, a sweat and urine. And that's it, that's all you need to know. On to number four. No, I'm just kidding. Can you imagine? And that's it. <laughs> okay, jokes aside, space missions are long. You're in orbit for a very long time, and there's only a limited amount of space on board for resources, and that includes important resources like water. International Space Station crew members actually recycle water whenever possible, meaning drinking their own urine and sweat. It takes the systems on board eight full days to process water and so desperate times call for desperate measures. Scott Kelly, an astronaut at NASA, said he drank about 730 litres of recycled urine and sweat during his year long mission. Like I hope they at least get filtered and they're not just straight up drinking piss and sweat. This is so like Bear Grylls, that man will take any excuse to be like, ah, oh, better drink my own piss. I really hope you guys know who Bear Grylls is, otherwise like you just will not understand how funny that joke was. <laughs> Number four now is the cigar. A bit of background so you really know how credible this is. Musa Manarov was a Soviet Azerbaijani astronaut who holds the record for longest continuous time in space 541 days. So he's had a lot of experience being in the dark abyss and seeing everything. One day in 1991, he was on his way to the MIR space station when something caught his eye. On camera, he caught two minutes worth of footage of what appears to be a cigar shaped UFO. It's just floating. It's lighting up at certain points, spiraling in every direction, and just actually there, existing. But many say it's hard to tell whether something is close or far away from you in space since you literally have no frame of reference. So you also can't tell how big or small it is. So this cigar could have been bigger than Earth, it could have been smaller than me, who knows? Musa vehemently denied it being space junk because he's seen space junk so many times and this ain't it. And considering he holds the record, I say we trust the man. I say we trust him. Filling our number three slot now is the black hole of doom. Ominous, isn't it? And it is. Now, two years ago, the Hubble Space Telescope found something that could be the death of us all. They found a black hole that can and does devour literally anything in its path. It weighs the equivalent of more than a billion suns. It can reach the speed of five million miles per hour. But don't worry, guys, it's only eight billion light years away from Earth. Well, that was two years ago. I don't know how much closer it is now, but I'm guessing it's closer. It's being manipulated by gravity waves, which means it's only a matter of time before it breaks free from its own galaxy and just starts roaming the universe free fall. And if that's the case, we can say sayonara to the Milky Way, goodbye Pluto, guess you'll stay the dwarf planet till death my man, bye bye. Now at number two is galactic cannibalism, as if human cannibalism wasn't bad enough, I mean clearly not. And also not to be confused with galactic collision. Well to keep it simple, there are big galaxies out there that are eating smaller ones, and by eating I mean the larger one merges with a smaller smaller galaxy through tidal gravitational interactions. And that doesn't mean the smaller galaxy disappears, the product is actually an irregular galaxy. Well known galaxy Andromeda actually ate a sister galaxy of the Milky Way 2 billion years ago and is expected to do the same thing with us in 4.5 billion years but that's all good cause I'll be dead by then. And for the people still alive, hopefully we would have developed into planetary travel by then or climate change killed us all. There is no in between, I'm not even worried about it. And finally, at number one is what really happened. So we know about Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon and the whole leap for mankind spiel but that wasn't the full story. According to Maurice Chatelain, the retired chief of NASA communication system, Armstrong saw things when he got off the spacecraft. Seconds before he stepped down the ladder, he saw two massive UFOs hovering above him and Edwin Aldrin even took pictures of them, like we have picture proof. That was followed by two minutes of radio silence because one of the television cameras overheated and then lost reception. So it doesn't just happen to us mere laymen, it happens to NASA as well. That makes me feel better. Now during those two minutes, there was a critical lost transmission, and that was Armstrong saying, these babies were huge sir, enormous, oh god, you wouldn't believe it, I'm telling you, there are spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge, they're on the moon watching us. And that was never made public, it was never even included in any of the records, and he refused to talk about the incident till his death. Thankfully enough people had corroborated the evidence and story back then that we do know it is true. I love how this massive part of history has this whole other side to it that we just didn't get told. I'm angry, I'm annoyed, and I wish Neil had told us before because that is shocking behaviour from Neil. Shocking. Starting us off at number 10 is the knocking. On a voyage to space back in 2008, Yang Liwei became the first Chinese astronaut to venture into space aboard the Shenzhou 5. On the night of October 16th, Yang had a very peculiar sound coming from outside. It sounded 
sounded like someone was knocking. The sound sounded like an iron bucket being hit with a wooden hammer. The scariest part of it all was that the sound wasn't coming from the inside of the spaceship and it wasn't coming from the outside, which makes no sense because space is a vacuum and you can't hear anything. Noise literally doesn't exist. Sound waves need a medium like water or air to pass through. So how did that even happen? Riddle me that, yeah? What makes this whole thing even weirder is that astronauts aboard the following Shenzhou 5 and 6 missions heard the same knocking. So was it a mechanism on the Shenzhou spaceships that caused this knocking to be heard? I don't know. I ain't a damn astronaut. Coming in at number 9 are Space Snakes. So this one comes from Dr. Story Musgrave, a man who has 6 academic degrees, was part of the Marine Corps, is a physician and mathematician, and he's a bloody NASA astronaut as well. Oh, and he shares the record of most space flights ever taken. So I mean, this man has literally lived 9 lives in one. Like, save some jobs for the rest of us, I swear to God. I'm just trying to get by at this point. Either way, a story said on two of his missions, he saw something out there that he doesn't have an answer to. He saw a snake sort of thing. It was six to eight feet long, it was rubbery, and it had internal waves inside of it. And it sort of just followed him for an extended period of time. He claims that being in space makes you see things you'd never imagine. Well, no sh**. And that he believes that there are creatures out there much more developed than any of us. And I mean, they've been out there for a hundred million years. I'd hope as hell they're advanced, more advanced than us. But honestly, my theory on the snake is that they're just alien devices that just roam space and detect spacecrafts in the area and sort of tail them and send that information back to the alien HQ that deployed it. Back to planet Blark. At number eight, we have decompression. So anytime a vessel goes on a voyage to outer space, the changes in atmospheric pressure the astronauts experience can be highly dangerous unless they're doing all the procedures correctly. The year was 1965, Soyuz 11 was re-entering Earth's orbit, and three crew members on board ended up dying when depressurized. A technician on the vessel back in Houston said while they were in the vacuum chamber, he accidentally depressurized his own spacesuit and then lost consciousness. He said the last feeling or sensation that he remembered was the moisture on his tongue beginning to boil. Rapid decompression is so serious, the symptoms can include vaporizing blood, swollen flesh, exploding eyeballs, and ruptured lungs. Can you imagine how screwed up the situation is when the moisture on your tongue is boiling? Say less. Also, do you guys like my nail color? I love it. Filling on the seventh slot is the green sighting. So Gordon Cooper is an astronaut that's flown the Gemini 5 and the Mercury 9. He was also the last American to ever spend time in space alone. In May of 1963, he was doing a circumnavigational trip around the Earth on the Mercury capsule, and when he was passing Perth, he saw something. A massive green glowing object came straight for him at a speed he'd never seen before. It was real, it wasn't just delusion, and the Muchy tracking station in Western Australia even picked it up on their radar, so it was very much real. Cooper reported it to NBC, but when he landed was told they couldn't question him about it. So that's just another thing that they won't tell us. I feel like we should honestly start rioting until governments all over the world stop keeping sh from us. I'm over it. I've had enough. Now, and number six is the alien music, which unfortunately cannot be found on Spotify or Apple Music, so you guys just don't even bother trying to find it. Just don't. Now, back in 1969, four days after we stepped foot on the moon for the first time, astronauts John Young, Tom Stafford, and Gene Kernan were on the far dark side of the moon. And as Mufasa said to Simba, we don't go there. Now the three men were just chilling on the moon, taking pictures of the craters and drinking some grape juice, when they started hearing a strange otherworldly sort of noise inside their headsets. The music continued for a good hour, and none of the men had heard these types of sound before, and knew no one would believe them if they told. They tried to find out where or what the music was, but they simply couldn't. Decades later, the mystery was just never solved, but some claim it was just sound coming from radio interference between spacecrafts. Which I get, but how would three seasoned astronauts not know what that sounded like. Surely they would have heard that a billion times before as well. Why the hell you lying? Why the hell you lying? I made it PG. Coming in at number five is the Millennium Falcon, not to be confused with the one in Star Wars. But watching the ISS NASA live feed back in 2016, Jaden Beeson said he saw a metal spaceship. He said the UFO that he saw seemed similar to the Millennium Falcon found in Star Wars, so he realized he definitely needed to take a screenshot to prove what he was seeing. The metal craft had a blue glow to it and stayed hovering above Earth for about two minutes. And it's very clear to see it's not even a small craft by any means, you can definitely see it. Either way, Jaden sent the image 
image to NASA, but he's never gotten an explanation or a response back, which makes the whole thing even that much more suspicious. All these crafts just hovering above Earth and they're just going away? Why? Come in, you guys. We're friends. At number four is the cigar. A bit of background so you know how credible this really is. Musa Manarov was a Soviet Azerbaijani astronaut who holds a record for the longest continuous time spent in space. That record, 541 days. So he's had a lot of experience being in the black abyss and seeing everything. One day in 1991, he was on his way to the Mer space station when something caught his eye. On camera, he caught two minutes worth of footage of what appears to be a cigar-shaped UFO. It's just floating, lining up at certain points, spiraling in every direction, and just actually there. But many say that it's hard to tell whether something is close or far away from you in space since you literally have no frame of reference. So you also can't tell how big or small it is. This cigar could be bigger than Earth, or it could be smaller than me. We don't even know. Musa vehemently denied it being space junk because he's seen space junk many times and this ain't it. And considering he holds a record, I say we trust the man. He sounds credible. Filling on a three slot is Major Vladimir. Now, Major General Vladimir Kovalyanok was a cosmonaut in the 80s who saw something bizarre during the Salja mission. They were moving over South Africa when he saw an oval shaped object. Now, initially it flew straight, but then an explosion of golden light occurred. A few seconds later, the oval object transformed into two golden spheres. After that, Vladimir just saw white smoke and the spheres just disappeared into thin air. He said he tried to take a picture of it, but it exploded before he had the chance. When he reported to Mission Control, it was all over Soviet headlines, magazines, newspapers, and most people excluded any option of it being extraterrestrial, but it did happen. It has no explanation whatsoever, and it was seen by not one, but two people, Vladimir and his partner, Viktor Savinyak. I hope I said that right. Seven years. Now, and number two are the other crafts. So we all know about Neil Armstrong setting foot on the moon and the whole leap for mankind spiel, but that was not the full story. According to Maurice Chatelain, the retired chief of NASA communications system, Armstrong saw things when he got off the spacecraft. Seconds before he stepped down the ladder, he saw two massive UFOs hovering above him and Edwin Aldrin even took pictures of them. That was followed by two minutes of radio silence because one of the television cameras overheated and then lost reception. How very convenient. During those two minutes, there was a critical lost transmission, and that was Armstrong saying, these babies were huge, sir, enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. And that was never made public. It was never even included in any of the records, and he refused to talk about it until his death. Thankfully enough, people had corroborated the evidence that we do know to be true. And I love how this massive part of history that has this whole other side to it we just didn't get told. I'm angry, I'm annoyed, but I wish Neil had told us because this is just shocking behavior on his part. Shocking. And finally, at number one is the check mark. Back in 2005, American astronaut Leroy Chow had been the commander of the International Space Station for about six months at that point. One day, he was installing some antennas 230 miles above Earth when something caught his eye. He saw the sequence of strange lights that seemed to be in a line that looked like an upside down check mark. Not Nike. It's not just do it. It's definitely not. But the formation flew by him and he was just flabbergasted at what the hell he had just seen. Skeptics tried to convince Leroy that what he had seen was just lights of boats reflecting upwards, but a reflection of light is one thing. You know when something has its own life and it's moving past you. Reflections only move, the thing that's being reflected is moving, which they weren't. Riddle me that. At number 10, we have green and shiny. Gordon Cooper was doing one of the most amazing things a human being has ever done. He was completing a 34 hour orbiting flight around the planet. This was in May of 1963. I can only imagine he saw parts of Earth that most people only dream of. But during this flight, he didn't just get an amazing view and some awesome pictures for Instagram. Also, that is the future of space travel. Influencers are gonna go up there and take a bunch of pictures in zero gravity and then space is gonna become a fad for all of the people who want to post it all over their social media. But anyways, during this flight, Gordon Cooper was approached by a green orbiting light that floated up to him in his spacecraft and then flew away. He was so amazed by this encounter that he talked in front of the UN and he said that, I believe that extraterrestrial vehicles and crews are visiting our planet from other planets. Hey, this guy has been to space. If anyone knows, it's this guy. 
At number nine, we have Incorrect. Do you guys know Chris Hadfield? You probably should, baby. He's got a master class. If you do it, they let you go to space. But here's one occasion where Chris was relaying information to the Russian Mir space station so they could dock on his ship. While this was happening, his sensors that tell him how far the station is started giving him the wrong information. This is terrifying to see because if they come in too slow, they won't latch and then they'll just be both floating out there in the void of space. And if they come in too fast, then they crash and everyone dies. One sensor was telling Chris that they were 32 feet away and another one was saying that they were 20 feet away. He thought that at least one of them had to be right, so he used his thumb to judge the distance and a stopwatch to judge the speed and then realized that they needed a touch more speed and got the connection perfectly. Now this is all very dirty stuff, but that is one of the most bad boss thug life things I have ever heard of in my life. The station weighs 250,000 pounds and the connection they have to hit is the size of a DVD player and he eyeballed it. Well now, I gotta take his master class. At number eight, we have Leroy's Lights. Leroy Chow is a former commander of the International Space Station, which is one of the coolest titles I have ever heard in my life. While he was working up there, he witnessed something very strange. He saw a line of lights floating through the sky like it was some some sort of formation. He said it looked like a grouping of UFOs flying in formation. He also said that it would be ridiculous to think that we are alone in the universe. And if he says that, it's gotta mean something, right? At number seven, something fell off. In 1991, Musa Manarov was on the Russian space station. He was watching a nearby shuttle do a very standard docking, and he decided it would be a good thing to get on camera. I mean, why not? How often are you up in space? Might as well take a few pictures to savor the moment. Now, what he did not expect to see was a little item fall off the spacecraft. Now a lot of you are probably thinking it was just a piece of the ship detaching or something, but the shuttle was already latched. There wasn't any movement that should have jostled something loose from the spacecraft, and then this mystery item fell directly from the ship down towards Earth. It didn't float in space. And it's all on camera, so you can check it out for yourself. At number six, we have Vlad and the Little Finger. In 1981, Vladimir Kolvanyuk was on board the Russian space station and he took a peek out of one of the windows. He saw something strange. He said it wasn't really a UFO, but just a little small object. Even if it's just a little finger sized device because it's supposed to be space, there's nothing out there. Well, he watched this thing for a moment and then it exploded. Maybe it was shy, I don't know. But it seemed that it wasn't some piece of debris or rock or something. There was something in it that made it explode. Maybe it was a UFO. UFO, just a very tiny one, or maybe it was some sort of surveillance device and exploded upon its own discovery. Whatever it was, it's gone forever now. And number five, we have, was it just a reflection or something real? James McDewitt was in space in 1964 and he saw something that he couldn't explain. There was something floating out in space. He said it looked like a ship, but it was in the shape of a beer can and it was glowing white. Now, when you hear something like this, you think aliens. And that's what all the press thought too when they heard this story and they ran it. Years later, he reviewed some of the footage and he said what he saw was just a reflection. Now, what do you think? Could this have actually been something out in space and the government told him to keep his mouth shut or was it just a reflection? And number four, we have toxic ammonia. Okay, this list is teaching me that astronauts are some of the coolest people around. Bob Kerman was on the International Space Station installing a bunch of upgrades. You gotta keep that station looking good. Now, while he was out in space doing this, a valve blew and sprayed ammonia all over his spacesuit. And this is very bad because because if he brought it back into the station, everyone would suffocate and die from the ammonia fumes. So he used his big brain. He floated out in front of direct sunlight because ammonia has a very low boiling point. This would burn the ammonia off of his suit. Another astronaut came out and then brushed his suit off and everyone wore mass breathing oxygen upon his re-entry just to be safe. Now look at the big brain on Brad. I mean, Bob. I meant to say Bob. Bob. And number three, what is that? noise seen or heard they are two sides of the same coin one being a little scarier than the other but just reading this story really freaked me out so i had to throw it on this list this was back in 2003 china would launch yang li wei into space now it wasn't just the trip of him being blasted in a rocket into the vacuum of space that was scary although the sounds of a roaring rocket ripping through the sky must be pretty terrifying it was what happened after yang got aboard the space station that night he was there and he heard some something very strange. There was a knocking coming from outside 
inside the space station. Now this is messed up for a lot of reasons. First, it's the vacuum of space. There shouldn't be anything floating around outside in space. And if there was, it shouldn't be alive long enough to knock. And the second reason, being even spookier than the first, it's the vacuum of space. It's the same reason as the first. Sound needs something to pass through so you can hear it, like air or water. As the old saying goes, in space, no one can hear you scream. So how could this have happened? Could this have just been something in the station that was making a weird noise? Maybe something was floating around loose and bumped against a wall? I don't know, but he heard it more than once. And number two, we have the Space Eel. This sounds like the title of a cheesy horror movie that was made in the 1950s. We're gonna take two things we don't understand and put them together and then you got a movie. Well, it's actually what Story Musgrave saw. He was an astronaut working with NASA and one day while floating around through the endless void, he saw something very strange. It was a long white space eel. He said it had its own propulsion system to move through space. That sort of discredits anyone who thinks it was just some sort of inanimate object. And that kind of thing does happen. Things fall off of spaceships and space stations and they will just be debris out in the open, just loose and going. And if the propulsion system wasn't enough to convince you, he said he saw this thing not once, but twice. And for the number one spot, we have the moon landing visitors. I don't care what you think about the moon landing. If you believe in it, cool. If not, cool. Leave me alone in the comment sections. I don't care. But for the believers, when Neil Armstrong and his crew landed on the moon, there was a lost transmission that Neil sent out when he stepped foot onto the moon. And it went like this. These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh my god. You wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecrafts out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. End quote. Apparently, there were two massive spaceships that were floating above them as they stepped out onto the moon. Now, this transmission was never released into the public until years later, and Neil didn't talk about it until right before he died. So if you don't believe in the moon landing, I guess this is a cover-up on a cover-up. Number 10. Extended space travel can change your DNA. Astronaut Scott Kelly, who spent a year at the International Space Station in 2016, returned to find out that he was two inches tall taller than his departing height. The new physical differences between Kelly and his identical brother, Mike, also an astronaut, were startling. Scientists compared the DNA of the two and found that besides growing two inches, Kelly's gut bacteria was completely different and his gene expression had changed. Scientists concluded that the changes were caused by the stresses of space travel, which can cause changes in a cell's biological pathways. Now, Although Kelly eventually returned to his original height, his other genetic changes were were seemingly irreversible, meaning Kelly and his brother are no longer identical twins, which is insane. Number 9. Time on Earth moves faster than time in space. Yes, this isn't just something that was made up for the film Interstellar, it's a real thing. Time moves differently in space. Due to time dilation, a percept of theory of relativity referencing a difference in the elapsed time measured by two observers, astronauts stationed in outer space lose approximately approximately one second per week. The spin of Earth, its orbit around the Sun, and the solar system's motion around the Milky Way all combine to decrease the time we experience on Earth. Though minuscule, the second per week dilation results in nearly a minute lost annually and more than 8.5 minutes lost each decade. Number 8. An astronaut was covered in toxic ammonia during a spacewalk. Bob Kerbeam was no stranger to spacewalking when he was installing upgrades to the International space station. But while out there, a cooling line broke and spewed toxic ammonia all over his suit. Now, For those of you who don't know, a spacecraft is a closed system, meaning that the only air that you have to work with is the air you brought up with you. Now, First, Bob had to stop the leak, then he had to figure out how he was going to get back in the space shuttle without bringing the volatile ammonia contaminating his spacesuit. But some good old fashioned science helped with that one. Ammonia has a low boiling point, so he just needed to vaporize it off his suit. To do this, he simply baked himself in sunlight for an extra 30 minutes, arguably one of the most surreal and terrifying 
sunbathing methods a human can experience. Later, a fellow astronaut brushed off the suit and equipment. To be extra cautious, they partially vented the shuttle airlock, and next to be even more careful, the shuttle crew all wore oxygen masks inside until they were positive nothing had made its way in. Nothing did make its way in, thankfully, but that sounds like a terrifying experience. Number 7. Magnetic Explosions Every day, the space around Earth booms with giant explosions. Yep, explosions. When the solar wind, the stream of charged particles from the sun, pushes against the magnetic environment that surrounds and protects Earth, it tangles the sun and Earth's magnetic fields. Eventually, the magnetic field lines snap and realign, shooting away nearby charged particles. This explosive event is known as a magnetic reconnection. While we can't see magnetic reconnection with our bare eyes, we can see its effects. Occasionally, some of the perturbed particles pour into Earth's upper atmosphere, where they spark the auras. Magnetic reconnection happens all across the universe, wherever there are twisting magnetic fields. NASA missions like the Magnetospheric Multiscale Mission measure reconnection events around Earth, which helps scientists understand reconnection where it's harder to study, like in flares on the sun, in areas surrounding black holes, and around other stars. I just don't like the idea of things constantly exploding around us, and we can't do anything about it. Number 6. A jammed solar panel threatened the safety of the entire ISS. Astronaut Scott Parazinski had to install a new module on the ISS that would serve as a node for the addition of future research laboratories. Part of the mission required changing the location of an array of solar panels. Things are going along really, really well until the crew inside commanded these larger solar panels to extend, he said. They got jammed up and the panels began to tear. It was unsafe to continue to extend this panel any further, you couldn't retract it either, Scott said. There was concern that if we even tried to undock the space shuttle, it might rip apart and hit the shuttle. After 72 hours of grueling work on the ground, NASA came up with a plan. Scott would have to travel further away from the safety of an airlock than had ever been previously attempted. It wasn't only the distance that was nerve wracking, as Scott explained, there was a real danger that we could do even worse damage to the space station. Then there was a partial risk to myself, because if there was any metal to metal connection with the solar panel or arcing, it could actually electrocute me or cause ignition of the 100% oxygen in my spacesuit. All the tools I was working with had to be specially insulated. The metal parts of my spacesuit had to be wrapped in special tape, he said. Thankfully, everything worked out and the mission was a success. And Scott has said, I still to this day think it's one of NASA's greatest accomplishments. Number five. Astronauts must drink recycled sweat and urine. This isn't as scary as it's just gross. Water is a limited resource in space, and because of this, astronauts must resort to recycling their own waste. It only takes about 8 days for the systems on the space station to process water. NASA astronaut Scott Kelly consumed approximately 730 liters of recycled urine and sweat during his year-long mission. It tastes like bottled water, says Lane Carter, the water subsystem manager for the ISS at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. I don't really trust him though. <laughs> he continued, as long as as you can psychologically get past the point that it's recycled urine and condensate that comes out of the air. Now, condensate is the collected breath and sweat of the crew, shower runoff, and urine from animals on board the station. 93% of all water on board is reclaimed, according to a video posted by Canadian astronaut Chris Hatfield while he was on the space station in 2013. We can recycle about 6,000 extra liters of water for the station every year, he said. I mean, you gotta do what you gotta do, but I don't think I could do that. Number 4. There are floating animal corpses in space. Okay, well this sounds strange right away, but this makes sense considering the first test subjects to make it to space were animals. Before space programs started sending people up into orbit, scientists couldn't agree on what it would be like for a living organism to leave Earth's atmosphere. What would be the effects of weightlessness on a mammal? How would the body handle radiation from the sun? So instead of sending people up in such a risky situation, the United States and Russia sent monkeys, chimps, dogs, and other animals into space in order to analyze such effects. And when a seemingly good thing turned into a failure, these animal corpses were launched into space where they reportedly float to this day and can be seen by astronauts making trips to space. While this is sad, this scene can seem a bit creepy too. Just imagine animal corpses floating around against the backdrop of a black and infinite space and you have to just go on doing what you came to do. I also feel like this would make me feel 
little sad if I was an astronaut and was missing my pet and saw that. Number three, space music. Sound needs a medium to travel and thus it cannot be heard in the vacuum of space. Yet, astronauts have returned to Earth with fascinating tales of hearing odd noises while in space, which is terrifying. During the Apollo 10 mission, which was a test run for sending the first men to the moon, astronauts were carrying various equipment with them which was being tested to withstand space as they were deemed essential for the moon landing. While circling the moon, the astronauts on the vessel heard a certain whistling sort of music. The music lasted for almost an hour and creeped the living daylights out of the astronauts. One of them described the sound as a sort of otherworldly music. On returning to Earth, the astronauts struggled for a while on whether or not to tell NASA and the rest of the world about what they experienced. Later, astronaut Michael Collins, who was also part of the Apollo 11 mission with Aldrin and Armstrong, revealed hearing similar music while on the moon's surface. An engineer from US Space Agency said the noises likely came from interference caused by radios within the lunar and the command modules. However, Al Warden, an astronaut on Apollo 15, disputed the explanation. Number two, space snake. Retired NASA astronaut Dr. Story Musgrave has accomplished a lot in his career as a spaceman. Only the second astronaut to fly on six space flights, Dr. Musgrave is also the most formally educated astronaut with six academic degrees. He is also the only astronaut to fly aboard all five space shuttles. With all this, he seems to be a really credible source and he has claimed that he saw an eight foot long white snake floating through space. Now it's not hard to imagine that this could have been a hose detached from the spacecraft, but Dr. Musgrave Grave remains adamant. He claims that he observed the six to eight foot long eel or serpent like creature on not one but two of his space flights. During multiple interviews, Dr. Musgrave has insisted that alien life is out there and that he has observed it, which is just scary. And coming in at number one, they're on the moon watching us. When astronaut Neil Armstrong took a walk on the moon and became the first man to do so in 1969, many conspiracy theories came to light. For one, people claimed he didn't actually go to the moon and that the footage was recorded in a studio. Of the many conspiracy theories surrounding this moment, there's one that remains a mystery to date. During the Apollo 11 mission, after Neil landed on the moon, NASA claims to have lost transmission for roughly two minutes. And in a reportedly secret message to NASA, Neil said, These babies were huge, sir. Enormous. Oh my god, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecrafts out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now that sounds absolutely terrifying, and whether this is true or not, the fact that NASA lost transmission with Neil for two minutes is scary within itself. Being out in space on a different planet and being completely alone is terrifying. In our number 10 spot we have The Grey Thing. This is a story told by an anonymous online user that claims to be an astronaut who once saw an alien in an underground US base. Take it with a grain of salt, but I wanted to include it because the story was super interesting to read. He claimed to have been traveling through a US base that he didn't want to name as there is only a number of people allowed in and he doesn't want to be tracked. Anyways, at this base, he saw a gray person that was quite definitely not from this planet. Also, when out in space, he had seen a fleet of aircraft that he knew were UFOs, but he didn't think we had any contact with them yet. It wasn't until that moment that he realized that not only do we have contact with them, the alien are actually already living among us. Interesting. Well, there are so many quote unquote whistleblowers that have mentioned gray people, so the story could be true. What do you think? In our number nine spot, we have the flying saucer. Astronaut Deke Slayton revealed in an interview in 1951 that he had seen UFOs. Technically not in space, but obviously the UFO would have come from space, so I wanted to include this one. He said that he was testing a P-51 fighter and flying at about 10,000 feet in Minneapolis when he spotted something strange in the distance. It was gray and kinda looked like a kite, but a kite wouldn't be flying this high, he thought. As he got closer, he saw that it was like a saucer, a disc. He eventually realized that it was starting to move away from him, and then as quick as a blink, it pulled about a 45 degree climbing turn, and then accelerated and disappeared. You can see why I wanted to include this one. 
In our number 8 spot we have UFO in orbit. Astronauts James Lavelle and Frank Borman have claimed to have seen a UFO during the second orbit on the Gemini. There have been many skeptics around this claim and they usually say that it was probably the Titan booster rocket that was at its final stage. However, Lavelle has replied to this claim saying that he could also see the booster rocket nearby when he saw the UFO. The exchange initially reported went as follows. Lavelle, bogey at 10 o'clock high, NASA employee. This is Houston, say again seven. Lavelle, said we have a bogey at 10 o'clock high, NASA employee. Gemini 7, is that the booster or is that an actual sighting? Lavelle, we have several actual sighting. NASA employee, estimated distance or size? Lavelle, we also have the booster in sight. Ooh, well, I don't know how the skeptics got around that, but skeptics are pretty committed to believing their own narrative about life in the universe, so oh well, let's let them stay in their boring world. In our number 7 spot we have enormous babies. There have been many reports from NASA employees of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin seeing aliens when they first arrived on the moon. Even though Buzz and Neil deny it, I'm sure they have been told to deny it if you know what I mean. A former NASA employee by the name of Otto Binder bypassed NASA's broadcasting and picked up the following being said. NASA, what's there Apollo 11? Response: These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh my god. You wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there. Lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Apparently, off the record, the astronauts have admitted to many scientists that they did indeed see something. Yeah, I believe it. It's silly to think that there is nothing out there. That's just, you know, human ego, I think, to believe that we are the only intelligent life. That mixed with human fear. In our number six spot, we have the lights. Of course, I couldn't have a list without the strange space light phenomena on it. An entire crew at the International Space Station in 2005 witnessed a set of strange lights projecting across space. Commander Leroy Chow has commented on this strange sighting and said that the light was in a weird formation as if it were an upside down V shape. The crew and Chow saw this fleet of lights in the shape of an upside down V fly past them. It would be one thing if it were just one person, but an entire crew witnessed this. That's a lot of people that would be lying. So personally, I think that's all the proof we need, folks. There is other intelligent life out there, and they may be close by. Perhaps they're already here and running our government. You decide. In our number five spot, we have alien interaction. This one needed to be included on the list because it's really just suspicious. Very sus. Apparently, Scott Kelly, a well-known astronaut and most notably known for spending a very, very long time on the International Space Station, the longest an astronaut has ever spent there actually. But anyways, Scott has been known to make quite a few jokes about the things he's seen out there and we have to wonder, are they really jokes or was he told not to speak his truth? He was quoted as once saying that aliens have it easier in space than we do. First off, someone's gotta teach this man what a joke is cause it's missing a punchline. And second, what does does that mean? What makes you say something like that? There must be some weird truth behind it. Anyways, I'm convinced that he's seen aliens. What about you? Let me know in the comment section below. In our number four spot, we have a fleet of UFOs. Allegedly, astronaut Gordon Cooper is another one who has reported seeing UFOs in space. If you haven't heard of Gordon Cooper before, then you should know that he flew both the Mercury 9 and the Gemini 5, so he's really had quite a lot of time in outer space. Apparently, he is now coming out and saying that around the time he flew for the Air Force, he saw a fleet of UFOs. Apparently, not more than 10 years later, he came across a similar scene. Allegedly, in 1963, one of them flew towards him, and to back up his statement, he has proof because it was picked up by the radar. Whoa. Also, what would be his reasoning for making this up? To gain fame? Nah. Well, I mean, it's possible, but he would have already gained some clout just by being an astronaut in space, so I feel like that's probably not likely, but anyways, I believe him. He's gone on to say that 
quote, I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet and other planets. Most astronauts were reluctant to discuss UFOs. I did have occasion in 1951 to have two days of observation of many flights of them, of different sizes, flying in fighter formation, generally from east to west over Europe. Fascinating. In our number three spot, we have the cylindrical object. Allegedly in 1991, a cosmonaut by the name of Musa Menarov caught a cylindrical object on film that he believed to be a UFO. The object was shiny and in the film it swivels and flies across space. Originally Musa thought it was something off the ship, but then after further investigation, nothing was missing from the ship. So after further reflection on seeing it and, you know, looking back at the footage, he's convinced it was some kind of UFO ship or UFO device. What's with all the UFO objects that are so shiny? Do you think this is a UFO? Or perhaps is it something from another planet? Let us know in the comment section below. Coming up in our number two spot, we have the mystery hut. The ending to this made me lol so hard that I had to include it. A mystery hut was discovered by China's astronauts and people operating their U-2-2 moon rover. This rover was making its way through the northwestern part of the moon when it was discovered. On the camera, a cubed shaped mystery hut was captured. This was only in November of 2021. It created a spectacle. Had moon people finally been discovered? Everyone was asking themselves. By January 2022, the rover was much closer. And what did it find? Oh, just a small piece of space rock on a crater rim. <laughs> The drama. Ooh, look, a mystery hut. Probably the moon men reside there. One month later, alas, it is a rock. Humans are funny. <laughs> in our number one spot, we have UFO footage. Recently in 2020, Russian astronaut, cosmonaut Ivan Wagner made a time-lapse video while orbiting space and he claimed to have found something. Space guests he called them. In his video, you see the curved edge of the Earth at night with a green swirl of the aura moving across the surface and several falling stars. It's such a cool video to see. Then, about nine seconds in, you see a fleet of five possible UFOs. He said that because it's in a time-lapse format. You can't measure how long they were there, but in real life, it was for about 50 seconds in real life time. This video is so crazy. Honestly, even if it's not alien fleet, to see such a beautiful sight with the falling stars is just unreal. It must be incredible to be an astronaut. <laughs> Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the docking procedure. Chris Hadfield is one of the best known astronauts of all time, and he had quite a harrowing story on his first space flight. During this flight, he and his fellow astronauts had the pleasure of somehow navigating a quarter million pound shuttle towards a target on the MER space station that was about the size of a coffee cup. Yeah, the most tense few minutes of their lives, I can imagine. Chris's job was to watch and communicate the speed and range information to the pilot, which is a super important job, obviously, because it's such a precise thing. There's a time window, they have to be traveling at just the right speed, and they need to be accurate. Chris explained, quote, if you hit MER just a little too soft, then the spring mechanisms would bounce you off. He went on to say, quote, if you hit MER just a little too hard, then you would break MER in half and kill the three people on board. So you've got to hit it exactly right. Yeah, definitely high stakes at this point. So when the crew is about 30 feet away, their two sensors start telling them completely different things. One said 32 feet and the other said 20 feet. Chris said, quote, they're either both wrong or one of them is completely wrong. Now, what do you do? There's nobody to ask. If the crew on board the flight deck of the shuttle don't solve this problem in the next 30 seconds, then the whole flight is bust and done. Instead of panicking, however, Chris explained that he just went, quote, back to basics. This insanely intelligent person knew the dimensions of the docking module, so he used his thumb to help him sort of eyeball the distance through a window. I mean, that alone is just wild. Apparently, this helped him to figure out that they were 21 feet away, not 32. He used his stopwatch to figure out the math of how fast they were going and when the thrusters should be fired, and thankfully, he was spot on. Chris finished the story by saying, quote, it wasn't for a few minutes before one of us looked around and said, hey, we did it, we're actually here. That was a big relief of emotion on board. 
Uh, yeah, I can imagine. In our number nine spot today, we have the gas leak. In July of 1975, the Apollo Soyuz test project took place, which was a historic moment for both space travel as well as just for politics. This was the first joint space flight between the United States and the Soviet Union, and it marked the end of the space race. And while it started off extremely smoothly and was going well, this flight soon became known for an entirely different reason. On return, the two spacecrafts, the American one holding three astronauts and the Soviet one holding two cosmonauts met in orbit around the Earth and docked to each other. Here the group began exchanging information, they were speaking each other's language to make communication easier, and also just as a sign of respect, things were going amazingly considering the recent history. After 44 hours together, they parted, and after a few more days, they were on their descents back to Earth. During re-entry, however, a malfunction with the reaction control system, which is the system that controls the altitude, this malfunction function ended up causing highly poisonous nitrogen tetroxide to enter the cabin where the American astronauts were. Thankfully, once this spacecraft landed, the cabin becomes ventilated, which gave them time to be rescued without being fatally injured. The astronauts on board were rushed to the hospital and were found to have developed a form of pneumonia that is caused from chemicals, but within weeks they all recovered and lived to tell the tale of this historic space flight. In our number 8 spot today, we have Mer EO 23 This is the name of a mission that was part of the Shuttle Mir space program, which was a quote, collaborative 11 mission space program between Russia and the United States that involved American space shuttles visiting the Russian space station Mir, Russian cosmonauts flying on the shuttle, and an American astronaut flying aboard a Soyuz spacecraft to engage in long duration expeditions aboard Mir. During this mission, on February 23rd, 1997, a backup solid fuel oxygen canister ended up catching fire. This fire was in one module but it quickly began to spew molten metal, and the crew on board was concerned that it could melt through the hull of the space station. Smoke began to fill the station, and the crew were forced to use respirators to continue breathing, but of course, when it rains, it pours, and some of the respirators were faulty and didn't supply oxygen. After burning for 14 minutes and the crew using up three fire extinguishers, the fire was thankfully put out. The smoke, however, remained thick for another 45 minutes. This was probably one of the most terrifying things that the crew went through, but this certainly was not the end of the road of struggles for these guys. Let me know down below in the comments if you want a part 2 of this video, and maybe we can cover the rest of what went wrong on this mission. In our number 7 spot today, we have Apollo 13. Definitely one of the most well known space missions ever. Apollo 13 is famous for all of the most terrifying reasons. This mission was the seventh crewed mission in the Apollo space program, and it was the third that was meant to land on the moon. The spacecraft launched on April 11th, 19 but the mission to land on the moon was quickly aborted two days into the flight after an oxygen tank in the service module failed. A quote, routine stir of an oxygen tank ignited damaged wire insulation inside it, causing an explosion that vented the contents of both the service module's oxygen tanks to space. Without this oxygen that's needed for breathing and for generating electric power, the service module's propulsion as well as their life support systems were just unable to operate. This meant that the command module systems had to be shut down in order to conserve the resources it had left for re-entry. This meant that the crew had to transfer to the lunar module as a sort of lifeboat. The lunar module was only designed to support two men on the moon's surface for two days, so mission control had to create new procedures so that it could support three men for four days. The crew was in for some of the most difficult times while the ground crew worked to help bring them home alive. Safe to say everyone was as stressed out as they could possibly be. Thankfully, the crew on board the ship were returned to Earth safely, and this story, although horrifying, did wonders to restore public interest in the Apollo program. This story is one of the most famous space stories ever, thanks to the several dramatizations made about it. In our number 6 spot today, we have the STS-27 disaster. During the launch of STS-27, which took place in 1988, debris from the right solid rocket booster struck the underside of the craft, which ended up severely severely damaging over 700 tiles on the outside of the craft, as well as taking off one tile completely. It might not seem like a lot, but every little thing matters when you're doing something like going to space. So it's important to note that this mission was classified because of the fact that there was a surveillance satellite being launched along with it. Because of this, things had to be done a little differently, so when the crew on board sent photos of the damage back to the ground, the photos were encrypted and they were extremely low quality. Mission control 
deemed the damage to be just light and shadows and told the crew to continue much to their dismay. Once landed, it became clear that Atlantis was the single most damaged shuttle that was thankfully able to successfully land. The survival of the crew came down to basically happenstance, which is just terrifying. This was only the second mission after the disaster of the Challenger, so should this one have gone fatal, we likely wouldn't have seen the continuation of the program. In our number 5 spot today, we have the organic object. Leland Melvin is an American engineer and retired NASA astronaut who served on board the space shuttle Atlantis as a mission specialist. He is an incredibly brilliant man with an incredible resume, and that is exactly why this story is so unnerving. He claimed that while on a space mission as he was orbiting Earth, which for the record, how cool would it be able to tell a story like that? You're just orbiting Earth. While he was on this mission, he saw a quote, alien-like organic object. NASA disputed his claims and said that what he saw was just ice, but I feel like I trust the person who actually saw it with their own eyes. Leland went on to write that whatever he saw was quote, translucent, curved, organic looking. I have no explanations to offer, but I will say it certainly is interesting and a little bit terrifying. In our number four spot today, we have the space snake. Dr. Franklin Story Musgrave is an American physician and retired NASA astronaut, and considering how credible he tends to be, despite the absurdities of this story, it makes it hard to pass off as a lie so easily. While he was in space, he claims that he saw something that I don't wish upon anyone, a sort of space snake. He said that he saw an 8 foot long white snake floating through space. I don't even know what I would do. Probably cry, call Houston, I'm not sure. There are many people who think that this was simply just a detached hose from the spaceship, but Dr. Musgrave remains adamant on what he saw, and to be completely honest, I kind of believe him. Maybe his mind was playing tricks on him, I mean, I don't know what happens in space, but I find it hard to believe that this person, who would likely be familiar with the parts of a spacecraft, mistook a hose for a snake. In our number 3 spot today, we have the lights. Leroy Chiao was the commander of the ISS in 2005, and this is exactly when this strange sighting occurred. It is said that he wasn't the only one who witnessed this though, as it is said that the entire crew was there to see this unexplainable occurrence along with him. Basically, they saw a strange set of lights while up in space. He went on to describe the lights and said that they were in the formation of an upside down V, and that they ended up stumbling upon this bizarre situation after the formation flew past them. I'm just gonna say it, we're all thinking it, it sounds a lot like aliens. I just don't have any other possible explanations, and you're telling me that the whole crew saw it? I swear, nothing will convince me more of aliens than an astronaut's first hand account. In our number 2 spot today, we have Glowing Green. Gordon Cooper is a well known astronaut after having flown the Mercury 9 and the Gemini 5, and in fact, he was the last American to spend time in space alone. But despite all these exciting accolades, I want to take you to May 15th, 1963. Here, he was sent off to space in a Mercury capsule for a 22 orbit journey around the Earth, and while on this journey, he saw something very unsettling a glowing green object that would approach his capsule. During his final orbit, Orbit, he did tell the tracking station of this object that was quickly approaching his capsule, and they were able to pick up this UFO on their radar, but once Cooper landed, reporters were told that he was not allowed to answer questions regarding this UFO. It's even more interesting considering how Gordon has been a vocal and firm believer in UFOs, so I ask. What do you guys think it was? In our number one spot today, we have space music. After four days of space travel in 1969, the Apollo 10 astronauts, Tom Stafford, Gene Cernan, and John Young, were on the far side of the moon. We were full of curiosity over what the other side could possibly be containing, but it wasn't necessarily the discovery people were expecting. While the astronauts were taking photographs and experiencing this new to humans area, they began to hear some otherworldly music coming from their headsets and this continued for one full hour. Gina is said to have exclaimed, boy, that sure is weird music, we're gonna have to find out about that, while John replied, nobody will believe us. For decades, this space music was left a complete mystery until just recently when an explanation was put forward. It is being claimed that perhaps this sound emanated from radio interference between spacecrafts. While this is a fairly reasonable explanation, not everyone is exactly convinced. 
Starting off this countdown, we have the fear of heights. Now, you might be like, why would you become an astronaut if you're afraid of heights? Don't ask me. But NASA astronaut Drew Futzel has a fear of heights, but this hasn't impacted any of his missions. In 2018, days before he was sent back into space, NASA released a video revealing five facts about the astronaut that people might not know. For one of the facts, he revealed he is afraid of heights. But like I said, this hasn't affected his mission. He has spent a total of 29 days in space and completed 42 hours of spacewalks over the course of two missions. That's pretty insane. Whereas other astronauts think that they're fine and they're not afraid of heights until they go to space and they're like, whoa, okay, look at Earth down there. We're really high up. In our ninth spot, we have the damage. Now, in part one of this video, I talked about mechanical failures. That's something that astronauts fear. Something that they also fear that is kind of along the same lines would be spacecraft failure. Like the craft itself getting damaged and it starts breaking apart. That's what's protecting the astronauts from space. If their craft breaks down, they are pretty much stranded. How are they gonna return home without a vessel to travel in? While extensive steps are taken to avoid this, it can still happen at any moment. They could get hit by a meteoroid or by space junk and it could easily bang up the craft and cause unrepairable damage. Or chemical leaks or air leaks. You just never know. And this is what keeps astronauts on their toes. In our eighth spot, we have the return home. I can only imagine how life changing going to space would be for someone. It could change an astronaut's life forever, but not always in a positive way. After being in space for so long, they are not used to the conditions of Earth. Some astronauts have developed really bad anxiety after returning home. The cause for this is the constant stimulation. In space, it's pretty quiet. When they return home, they need to get used to the noise of crowds and everything constantly going on around them. This often overwhelms them. Others worry about the physical impact space has on their body. Getting used to gravity again apparently makes astronauts feel really sick, and for months, they feel woozy and they feel like they're just gonna throw up constantly. Also, when astronauts return home, it throws off their balance, so it's like learning to walk all over again. Honestly, at this point, I'm like, where are the pros of going to space? All I see are cons. Moving on to number seven, we have dying. One of the most common fears in the world is the fear of dying. If you stay out of harm's way, you have a less chance of dying. But for astronauts, well, they're being sent into the unknown. Anything could happen at any given time and they could die. I think we all know by now how dangerous their job is. So, I mean, it makes sense that astronauts would be fearful of losing their life in space. Moving on to number six, we have the orbit fire. This is pretty crazy. Fires in space are very real, and a flame in microgravity can be even more dangerous than a fire on Earth. Why? Well, the flame can survive on less oxygen and can burn for a longer period of time. This actually happened in 1997 aboard the Mir Space Station. On February 24th, six crew members were in serious danger when a fire ignited aboard the craft. According to one of the astronauts aboard the craft, he said, and I quote, the fire was so enormous and the smoke and vapor coming off this fire site was such that we couldn't see at arm's length. And I could not at that time have imagined that we go on with the mission. Now they did end up putting out the fire, but what made this so dangerous is that it took a while before the fire was even detected. That's because on Earth, hot air rises. So the smoke detectors pick up on the smoke and then the the alarm sounds. In space, the smoke doesn't flow like that. It will just follow the flow of the ventilation systems, meaning it will take a while before the smoke detectors do pick up on it. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with getting trapped. Imagine being miles and miles away from home with no way to get back. This is another thing that astronauts fear. They get sent into space and it ends up being a one-way ticket. Whether that be their craft malfunctions and there's no way to fix it, or from losing permanent contact with ground control, who knows? But if they do get trapped in space, they're kind of SOL, just floating around for days until they run out of food supplies or oxygen, or all of the above. In our fourth spot, we have the oxygen. At any time, a spacecraft could lose air pressure and oxygen and then become a death trap for the astronauts. There's just tons of things that could go wrong with the oxygen in space. Like for the Apollo 13 mission, the crew experienced a blown oxygen tank and the other was leaking very fast. Thankfully, they were able to stop the leaks and had enough breathable air to still make it home. But still, 
it could have ended much worse. Now, what would happen in the worst case scenario if they lose air pressure and oxygen? Well, the astronauts wouldn't die instantly. They would black out in about 15 seconds because in that amount of time, deoxygenated blood will have arrived to their brain. With no oxygen, the brain shuts down pretty dang fast. Also, low pressures will force the gas exchange in their body to start reversing itself. So the oxygen will be pulled out of your body and thrown into the lungs where it's released out of the body. If you try holding your breath, your lungs will probably rupture. Then you'll experience hypoxia. Your skin will turn blue, you'll lose vision and convulse, among other nasty things like having your body just swell up. So yeah, I could see why that scares astronauts, yeah. <laughs> In our third spot, we have the ammonia leak. This is apparently what NASA trainers tell astronauts. They say, and I quote, if you smell ammonia, don't worry about running the procedure because you're gonna die anyway. How great is that? How reassuring. So liquid ammonia is used to keep the station's electricity generating solar panels cool. However, ammonia is highly toxic. In March of 2021, two astronauts doing a spacewalk outside of the International Space Station had to be checked for ammonia contamination. The two were outside fixing the cooling system when frozen flakes of ammonia were released. The astronauts had to have their suits inspected for ammonia crystals before returning to the station. If it's brought inside, well, it's hella corrosive and also a huge irritant to one's eyes and lungs. In our second spot, we have the suit problems. Probably the worst time for an astronaut's suit to malfunction would be when they're out on a spacewalk. This happened in 2001 with Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield. He was out on a spacewalk when his left eye suddenly started to sting and fill with tears. Well, the tears ended up forming a blob of fluid that covered his right eye. So he's got his left eye stinging and tearing up, and we got his right eye obstructed by the tears. So he was left blinded while out in space. Now, Chris was worried that maybe his eye was stinging because of a toxic gas leak in the suit. So ground control told him to release all the air in his suit to get rid of the potential contaminant. So this guy's in space. He can't see, and now he's told to get rid of all breathable air. I would be like, hell no, I'm not doing that. But Chris did as he was told, and that did the trick. Turns out, thankfully, the thing that irritated his eyes was the anti-fogging agent that was applied to the inside of his visor. So it was nothing deadly. And in our number one spot today, we have the drowning. Now, you might be thinking, Lindsay, how does one drown in space? Well, it's actually much scarier than you actually realize. And this happened on July 16th, 2013 to ECA astronaut Luca Parmitano during his spacewalk. So Luca was out on his spacewalk when he felt water on the back of his neck. Turns out that some contamination blocked a fan pump in his suit, which caused the water to back up and start filling his helmet with coolant water. Soon enough, the water in Luca's suit was blocking his vision. He had no way to clear his eyes, nose, or mouth. Thankfully, he was able to make it back to the space station just in time before he drowned. Starting off number 10 now, we have the knocking. In 2003, Yang Liwei became the first Chinese person in space. It was a historic occasion, but it also became famous for a creepy occurrence. In 2016, Yang told an interviewer that he heard someone knocking on the outside of the spaceship on that trip. He was terrified and tried to peek out of the porthole, but couldn't see anything outside. When he got back to Earth, Yang described the sound to experts. He even tried to recreate it for them, but nobody could identify it. In the years since, many people have tried to explain this strange phenomenon. Some say it could have been some space debris, but others say that this is unlikely. A space debris is few and far between. Others claim it could be the expanding and contracting of the ship due to the changing temperature of the spaceship as it orbited the Earth. Even though that's the leading theory, many people have their own theories about aliens or time travelers being responsible for the mysterious knocking sound. Moving on to number nine now, we have alien music. In 1969, American astronauts Tom Stafford, Gene Kernan, and John Young went to the far side of the moon for the Apollo 10 mission. It was going to be the final test before Apollo 11 took three humans to walk on the surface of the moon for the first time. When the Apollo 10 astronauts were orbiting around the far side of the moon, they took photographs of its surface. As they were working away, they began to hear 
music. Specifically, they heard a strange whistling sound that lasted nearly an hour. When it faded away, Commander Kernan said, Boy, that sure is weird music. We're going to have to find out about that. Pilot Young replied, Nobody would believe us. And for the most part, they were right. Many people couldn't explain the sound that they claimed to have heard, and so they just didn't believe it. The leading theory is that the sound came from radio interference between spacecrafts. Some people have dismissed that though, and have insisted that the astronauts would would have known the difference between radio interference and their spacey music. Coming in at number 8 now, we have Snakes in Space. In 1994, Dr. Story Musgrave did an interview where he described his career as an astronaut, and one particular time which shook him to that day. He said, On two of my missions, I still don't have an answer. I have seen a snake out there. Six, seven, eight feet long. It is rubbery because it has internal waves in it, and it follows you for a rather long period of time. The more you fly in space, the more you see an incredible amount of things out there. And that sort of thing brings to you, really, a certainty that other living creatures are out there. Now, usually an account like this might be dismissed, but Musgrave is a doctor, he has six academic degrees, is a trained mathematician, he was in the Marine Corps, and was a NASA astronaut. He seems like a credible witness. He believes that there are advanced creatures existing in space itself Itself, and that he has even tried to communicate with them in the hopes that they come down and get him. Whatever that means. Next up at number 7 now, we have docking. In 1995, famous Canadian astronaut Chris Hadfield had his first space flight. His job was to relay the speed and range information to the pilot as they were docking into the Russian Mir space station. Any mistakes could have resulted in a total disaster. Too soft and they would have just bounced off. Too hard and they would have broken the space station in half, killing the three people on board. Everything was going smoothly, but then one of the sensors started telling them they were 32 feet away, the other said 20 feet away, which was correct. If they didn't solve the problem in 30 seconds, it was over for them. Hadfield had to calculate how far they were away in his head, timing it with his stopwatch to decide when they should fire their thrusters. Luckily, they ended up being spot on, and they docked almost perfectly. It took a few minutes before the astronauts began to realise they had done it. They were alive, they had avoided a space disaster, and they had lived to tell the tale. Moving on now to number 6, we have Impossible. On May 5th, 1981, Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Kovalyanok looked out of his portal of the Salyut orbital space station. He then saw something which seemed inexplicable to him. When he returned to Earth, he told the world at a conference what he had seen. He said, Many cosmonauts have seen phenomena which are far beyond the experiences of Earthmen. For 10 years, I have never spoke on such things. The encounter you asked me about happened on May 5th, 1981, at about 6 pm during the Salyut mission. At that time, we were over the area of South Africa, moving towards the area of the Indian Ocean. I just made some gymnastic exercises when I saw, in front of me, through a porthole, an object which I could not explain. I saw this object, and then something happened that I could not explain, something impossible according to the laws of physics. The object had this shape, elliptical, and it flew with us. From a frontal view, it looked like it would rotate in flight direction. It only flew straight, but then a kind of explosion happened, very beautiful to watch, of golden light. That was the first part. Then, one or two seconds later, a second explosion followed somewhere else, and two spheres appeared, golden and very beautiful. After this explosion, I just saw white smoke, then a cloud-like sphere. Before we entered the darkness, we flew through the Terminator, the twilight zone between day and night. We flew eastwards, and when we entered the darkness of the Earth's shadow, I could see them no longer. The two spheres never returned. That was the end of the quote. There have rarely been descriptions so vivid and detailed, and many people who hear Kovalyanok's story hold it up as proof of extraterrestrial life. Moving on now to number 5, we have Toxic. In the mid-90s, Bob Kerbeam took part on his first spacewalk as an astronaut. Unfortunately, disaster struck when a connector to a hose began to leak on the outside, spraying toxic ammonia 
all over him. He couldn't get back inside the space station covered in that stuff. He managed to stay calm and he fixed the leak, but he was still contaminated. He came up with a plan. Ammonia has a low boiling point, and so Bob decided to literally bake himself in the sunlight of space for an extra 30 minutes in order to vaporize the ammonia off him. He had to just sit out there in space, hoping that he got all the ammonia off and that he didn't poison the crew and himself when he got back into the station. It was a success. His plan worked, but it was one of the most surreal and scary moments an astronaut could ever experience. Next up at number 4 now, we have the lights. In 2005, astronaut Leroy Chiao was commander on the International Space Station for over 6 months. He was once doing a spacewalk to repair some antennas when something caught his eye. He saw some lights that seemed to be in a line, almost like an upside down check mark. They flew right past him, but his fellow astronaut didn't see because they were facing the other way. When he described the sighting to those back on the ground, they dismissed it as a fishing boat hundreds of miles below him. Chiao himself had stated that he doesn't believe there's ever been any tangible evidence that someone else is visiting Earth or has done so in the past. He has simply told his story as it is and is leaving all of the explaining up to everyone else. Coming in at number 3 now, we have the drifter. Now for some people, the biggest fear they have about space is that feeling of drifting away from the space station, unable to claw themselves back. Well, Scott Parazinski may have had the closest experience to that. He was performing a spacewalk when a jammed solar panel threatened the safety of the entire space station and the crew inside. After 72 hours, NASA came up with a plan. Scott was told to travel further away from the safety of an airlock than had ever been attempted. He later said in an interview there was a real danger that we could do even worse damage to the space station. Then there was the potential of risk to myself because if there was any metal to metal connection with the solar panel or arcing, I could actually electrocute myself or cause ignition of the 100% oxygen in my spacesuit. The stakes were high, but Scott succeeded. Disaster was averted, but sadly, many of Scott's heroics are still not known by the masses. Moving on to number two now, we have the secret transmission. In 1975, retired Chief of NASA Communication Systems, Maurice Chatelain, published his book, Our Cosmic Ancestors. In it, he made an extraordinary claim about the first manned mission to the moon. He said, Only moments before Armstrong stepped down the ladder to set foot on the moon, two UFOs hovered overhead. Edwin Aldrin took several pictures of them. Some of these photographs have been published in the June 1975 issue of Modern People magazine. Now, this claim was linked to the story that there were two minutes of radio silence after. After Armstrong set foot on the moon, people claim that the lost audio was of him saying, These babies were huge, sir. Enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out here lined up on the far side of the crater's edge. They're on the moon watching us. Now, of course, all of this is speculation. An actual recording of that audio or of those pictures has never surfaced. That either means it didn't happen at all or it's been covered up very, very well. Either way, it's a creepy story. And finally, number one now, we have the Green Bolt. Gordon Cooper was a well known astronaut who flew on the Mercury 9 and Gemini 5 missions. He was the last American to fly alone in space. In 1963, he flew aboard the Mercury capsule for a circumnavigational trip around the world. Everything seemed to be going okay, and then, on his final orbit, as he passed over Perth, Australia, he saw a green object swing towards him at an incredible speed. At first, he thought it was just a figment of his imagination. There have been times where pilots and astronauts have seen objects like this but their equipment detected nothing. This time was different though. The Moochia tracking station in Western Australia actually picked the object up on their radar. That was huge. Now he had something solid to back up his own experience. He reported the incident to the National Broadcasting Company. When he returned to Earth, he was eager to tell his side of the story, but Gordon claims he was approached by NBC reporters who told him they had been instructed to not question him about the sighting. All of this has only fanned the flames of a UFO conspiracy. Mm -hmm.